good to be here. I've been here for many shows, and I love Ice House, so I want to thank the Bush Foundation and uh, Citizens League and Indigo and, and Pollen and Chief Minneapolis for organizing these events. Um, someone in education, I've, like, like Adia mentioned, I've been in education for almost 20 years, and a dialogue locations like this are infrequent, so it's a great opportunity. Um, I want to thank some of my colleagues that are also here. Jamie Tomlin, who I work with at Gordon Parks, is up there. We collaborate in a classroom, and everything I show you tonight is born out of collaboration. Everything's born out of uh, listening to students, working with my colleagues, hearing great ideas, and bringing it into action. Um, I also want to thank the, just the teachers in my life, like my mother, a, a teacher. She's sitting over there. <laughs> Put the hot spot on. But I think... My Aunt Carol, my Uncle Dave, uh, who's not doing too well right now, so I want to dedicate this to him. But uh, teachers in my life who pointed me in this direction, I wouldn't be doing it without them. And um, just to introduce like, a little bit more about me, like uh, reflecting about where uh, my work comes from, and I'd say I started my teaching career in Japan, two years seeing the testing industry up close, high stakes testing of Japan. Uh, coming back to America after that experience, and people said, wow, it must have been amazing to see these incredible schools, and I did, but I also saw the far reaches of the testing system. I watched a student jump out of a second-story window in Japan. Um, High-stakes testing is not all it's cracked up to be, and we're realizing that, but I saw that in the very first years of my teaching, so that always was the lens that I saw other things through. Um, I taught at Como High School in St. Paul uh, for a couple years when they had perfect ACT scores. Again, is that the entire school? What does that mean to have a perfect ACT score? And the, those things that shaped me and informed some of the choice to work at Gordon Parks High School, where I've stayed. And I've uh, become the curriculum coordinator at that school, and I'm now entering the 10th year of that. And tonight, I'm not so much about filling your note sheet with tips rather than wanting to spark a dialogue. Uh, I see the real change in education coming from you, from taxpayers. That's why I'm excited for these events that are a blend of teachers and people that are just interested in education. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about what my job's like at Gordon Parks. But before I get into that, I just want to point out this photo behind me. What's, what's the product of our classrooms? Do our, do our classroom experiences reach an audience? Do they reach taxpayers? And in this photo, you see Haleen, the student right there, looking back at the camera. That's a group of students and teachers. They're out seeing something they made in school in a standards-driven classroom. They're out downtown Minneapolis seeing a project that's being shown on the billboards downtown Minneapolis. Are, my question is, are these classroom experiences systematizable? Are they replicable? I think they are. I'd like to propose that this presentation is to spark a dialogue and an appetite for you to want more of this in the schools in Minnesota and elsewhere. But you really need to know about the school I work at. I'm really proud of this school, and I feel very lucky to be part of the team at the school. Um, Gordon Parks High School is located at University in Lexington in St. Paul. It's an alternative learning center. It serves all the high schools in St. Paul. Our students are primarily aged 17 to 21. And they, so if you're a student at Johnson High School and you get behind in credits, you could qualify to Gordon Parks. You could qualify to attend Gordon Parks if you're a student at Johnson, et cetera. It doesn't have a particular draw area the whole city, so any student in the entire city could go there. And there are many reasons why students attend our school. It could range from everything from um, entering into the mainstream school system as an immigrant and uh, going to our school to get caught up on credits, or it could be that you broke your leg and got behind in classes. A variety of factors bring students to our school, but the main thing is that they're behind in credits. So as a curriculum coordinator at the school, my job is to work on curriculum that works for these students, uh, that in their words, not mine. What works for you? And following the patterns of that to, to try to develop things that are sustainable. And also, my job is to live up to the namesake of our school, Gordon Parks. 
How many of you know who Gordon Parks is or was? Okay. It's, it's a mix. And after asking that question many times in St. Paul and elsewhere, Gordon Parks' legacy is something we want to promote, too, as a school. He, so the, the quick sketch of his life is that uh, born in Kansas but spent his teen years in St. Paul, was homeless on the very street that our school is located, got his first photography break downtown St. Paul, went on to become the first African-American photographer for Life magazine, um, had, became the epicenter of pop culture when he made the film Shaft, and his son made the film Superfly within four years. Uh, author, author, poet, I brought a couple of his books here tonight. Maybe his most famous book is A Choice of Weapons. And I'm going to share a couple excerpts from that tonight. But really, an extremely full life and so many pathways that we could then take as a school, developing curriculum around his life. But again, where does curriculum come from? What is curriculum? If we're going to create a Gordon Parks infused curriculum, what does curriculum provide for a school? So one way to think of curriculum is like a blueprint for a house. It defines the type of materials you buy, uh, the extent of the materials, and it gives, provides you some direction about how to do them. But the artisanship of the, and the craftsmanship still comes down to the person who's creating the wood, uh, the wood displays and other um, finery in the home. Now in schools, curriculum defines how we spend our budget. Along with the mission, the curriculum helps make decisions about budget and where we, uh, where we assign PD and how we get trained. So curriculum is very important for school. So if it's new to your lexicon, I encourage you to really follow the curriculum. Follow the curriculum, follow the money in America that derives the curriculum that our schools use. Know that as taxpayers, you fund 60% of Pearson Corporation's annual profit. Their annual $8.2 billion profit, 60% comes from the American testing industry. And the testing industry impacts the curriculum that goes into schools. With the test-directed curriculum, that's, you shouldn't be surprised with those results. Minnesota enters into a $32 million three-year MCA testing contract, your money. I'm going to show you some ways that that money can have additional uses to develop curriculum at schools. And some of the tools are simple. This is something that Jamie and I use in our classroom. We just call it the radius activity. Uh, at the beginning of a course, and by the way, at our school, we use three-week grading cycles. Um, at the beginning of a three-week grading cycle, we show this. And we listen to students. What do they point out within a half mile of our school? What, what are some of the topics within a mile of the school that are important to them? And we, we define that, like, what are some of the things in your community that impact you? And they share that with us. And then from that, we get ideas about the direction that our curriculum can, do, can go. We think about the standards, but we also think about how the, the, the hyper-local topic can influence the way that we deliver the standards. And some of our best project ideas have come directly from students. And it changes the way that these projects unfold when a student has proposed a concept and then we follow up on it. Decentering the instructor. Think of the instructor as someone who's listening, pulling in resources, rather than, here, take these notes, I'm going to share this wisdom with you. And it's really important for us to think about that in this day and age as we're decolonizing education. We're thinking about the British colonization influence and kind of the interrupting that quote unquote gold standard of education around the planet. Part of that is decentering the instructor. If you do that, it'll lead you in the directions of further decolonization. But this example on the screen is called the Transitions Project. So, if this reminds you at all of Wing Huey's University Avenue project, that's on purpose. Um, we were very inspired by Wing Huey, the photographer's work on University Avenue, telling the stories of business owners and so forth. So we created a project based on our students talking about the light rail. We knew the light rail was coming. So we started to communicate with the Met Council and found that all the local newspapers were full of amazing nonfiction text that had meaning and purpose in our students' lives. And they were telling us about that. So we were listening, but then also pulling in more re resources on our own. 
we reached out to the Minnesota Historical Society and studied these maps of University Avenue and the light rail passing right by the front of our school. We knew that out in the street there were still the rails from when the light rail, the, uh, the, you know, the trolleys were running on University Avenue. And the students found these aspects of history, history fascinating in their words, uh, showing them photos of buildings that they see each day and then kind of turning back the clock to um, what it looked like before. We wanted to do, we wanted to document the before, during, and after of the light rail project. So what we did is we began interviewing people in the community and following up on the things that they, they talked about. Of course, many community members were talking about Rondo. I know you can't see this map, but the Rondo community was displaced by the construction of 94. Uh, Mayor Coleman and just a couple years ago apologized for that, but still, that doesn't make up for it, and the rich history that's part of Rondo is part of our students' lives. Thinking like um, Sam was talking about, about different generations, so the experience of Rondo was just yesterday for many of our students. Their parents lost businesses. Their parents moved, had to rent when they owned in Rondo. So it's a big part of their life, and it came up as we interviewed people about the light rail. We also were able to um, bring photography into our classroom. Uh, arts programs are being cut, but in our classes they're being increased. We're bringing the creativity in the classroom. This, this project was taught in an art classroom. It was also taught in an interdisciplinary class with both social studies and English. It was also taught in a straight English classroom. Right now, Jamie and I teach a, um, a double English class where we have two periods next to each other that ended up being a very effective model to do this project-based learning. I want to read a quote from Gordon Parks that guides our use of photography and digital storytelling in school. So this is when he was in a, in a car with some of the Black Panthers. And Gordon Parks said, you've got a 45 automatic on your lap, and I've got a 35 millimeter camera on mine, and I still think my weapon is the most powerful. So for our students, they carry around cameras and audio recorders all day. They go to bed with them at night, their smartphones. They have these devices everywhere with them. So if there's a way that we can connect our class with these tools, it takes learning outside of the classroom. And they told us things like this, transitions, this project makes me want to get involved in my community. If it wasn't for this class, I probably wouldn't be at school most of the time. It's really important that we have experiences like this in our school. And uh, could you queue up that website? The product of, or the result of five years of working on this project was a website that I want to show you right now. This is a time lapse right in front of our school. And it shows the transition on the avenue. And if you click up in the videos section, you'll see the volume of films that the students produced. In five years, uh, reached about 40 short films. And if any of you have made a short film, you know the significant amount of time that takes. The public interprets documentary film different than other genres of film. Uh, the public, your standard definition of documentary film makes the public think about research and writing in ways that are different than other mediums of film. And those who are involved with other mediums, I respect the amount of work that goes into that. I'm talking about the public perception of it. So as an educator, if you want to produce work in your class that connects with film, documentary is especially conducive to, to work in schools. These films are searchable by topic. So we tag the films with difficult concepts like gentrification. So three or four of our transitions films tackle that subject very well in student words. And the student did the interview. So our, we can tackle difficult topics and we, our students are actually developing the materials we use in our classroom, not Pearson Inc. So if we can go back to the slideshow. Um, so some of the best practices we learned over the years of this project were that uh, student-driven work is very effective in a classroom. 
with students that have not been connected with really any other classroom they've been part of. They may be 18 years old and have 65, 70 credits left to go. Uh, connecting with the real audience is very important. We pulled a lot of that out, out of education. But if we can reconnect students with real people, and I know that might sound simple, but it takes some courage for educators to step in that direction. It works. It's something that um, connects the dots for students. It, may, it brings purpose to their classroom. And for the sake of time, I'm going to move on to something that happened during the Transitions Project. Another best practice is that when you open up to community-derived curriculum, the ideas just start rolling in. On one of the field trips for the Transitions Project, a student, Bruce, went up to this miniature model of University Avenue, and he found our school on the model, and there was a green piece of plastic behind our school, and he peeled it up, and he said, he yelled out, they're gonna build a park behind our school. 20 students rushed next to him and said, oh my God, they're gonna build a park. And the director came up and said, I'm sorry, they're not gonna build a park, it's just a stormwater runoff plan. And everyone was just deflated. But the teachers and I saw that. That same day, we went back to our school, checked out that here's our school. And behind our school, there are two vacant parcels. There was a for sale sign, so we called the realtor. Had him in the school within a number of days. Will the sellers donate the property? No. So then, <laughs> had all the kids there saying, well, they, um, But we dug our heels in. We made a film. Made a film, uh, met with uh, one of the uh, reps for our part of town, Melvin Carter. Um, got it on the political landscape. Worked with students at the U of M who came to a class and listened to student ideas, developed a concept for the property. And I'm moving very quickly over multiple years here. Um, the students. We had a saying at the school, like, all roads lead to the park. So when people in the community would come to us saying, would you like to partner with us for a mural project, we would say, make it connect with the property, because that's what the students wanted to see. This mural played a very important role. A gentleman named Gil Penalosa came to St. Paul. He's an urban planner. He saw the mural, and our students' presentation about the mural was so moved to mention to the mayor that night over dinner that it's a world-class story going on here in St. Paul, these students trying to get this park built. The mayor put it in the 880 Vitality Plan, and with help from Lex Ham and the members of uh, the residents of Skyline Towers, our work paid off, and $1.5 million was put toward the park, but it was a $2.5 million purchase price. So students then presented at the Great River Gathering about their civic-engaged uh, digital storytelling projects, and private donations came forward to the tune of a million dollars, and it trickled down to 500. But essentially, there was enough money to buy the property. With the help from the Trust for Public Land, the city of St. Paul now owns three properties. And you see, um, oh, it's hard to read fine print, but basically, initially, we were aiming for 2.5 acres. The final purchase was a five acres. So it's a really substantial project. So from the Green Space Project, the civic engaged digital storytelling, the ideas that these, these unattainable goals in the community are attainable. And in fact, so something Jamie and I are still surprised by is that the sheer impossibility of some of the ideas is the driving factor for the student. Um, not, not turning in work that goes to the teacher, gets graded, and gets recycled at a return. Something more substantial than that in student words that it turns into something that can change the community. And as teachers, we learn that you know, the convergence of student interests, civic engaged opportunities, and standards, that's the sweet spot. That's the civic engaged digital storytelling. And diagramming like this is really important because um, we'll often get the question by a teacher, and, and this is natural because many teachers, they've been trained for a test-driven system. They'll say, okay, Paul, it sounds great, but I am, required to teach the standards, as if it's one or the other. So it's very intentional that we talk about this as an overlap. I'm moving quickly here, that on the 25th of May, if you want to get involved with the park, uh, we have an event where it's a community gathering on May 25th. I'll send you an e email about it afterwards. 
And there are best practices around civic engaged digital storytelling. It's not a one, it's not alone, it wasn't created in isolation. Um, participatory action research and Mimi Ito's connected learning. But I'm gonna move very fast just to wrap up that um, these ideas of what we were seeing at the school and the patterns informed an application that I uh, applied for a Fulbright scholarship to go to India. I learned of an organization called Video Volunteers and their mission is empower marginalized communities. And their focus is digital storytelling, film. So I traveled there with my family we stayed in Goa where the video volunteers home office is located and then I traveled out to other places to see the training processes of video volunteers. It was a complete adventure and in this presentation I can only scratch the surface but would be happy to share with you or your school. I learned what it's like to be a trainer and work with people with no background in film like my students in St. Paul but who have an interest in storytelling to make change. And then also from the, from the audience, the people receiving the training, their perspective, traveled to the actual trainings in different parts of India. And then really those personal stories, the satisfaction and reward that young people get out of this level of involvement, real active citizenry. Um, India as the largest democracy on the planet and a place that we should continue sharing notes uh, around our educational reform. They have many of the same priorities as us. And they always make two films instead of one. So I'm, the experience in India has really shaken up the way that we think about our digital storytelling work at Gordon Parks. And the practices and the wisdom from a completely different culture around social change, still learning from that and challenging our notions in our classroom. And uh, I just want to end on the website that's the product of the project. So um, I want to continue the dialogue with educators because I've met so many that are interested in this type of work in their classroom. And part of it's interpreting something that might be passed off as impossible. So is it impossible to systematize the things that have occurred at Gordon Parks? I would argue it's not. And there are practices developed with educators that have uh, had multiple experiences with that, like reaching that, the end goal and doing that with multi-year projects that are kind of, neat. They have, there's great need for that to be demystified in schools. And um, if you go up to the educator's guide up there, there's uh, just a searchable archive of projects and planning that we've used at Gordon Parks. And I would just leave you with the idea that I'd like you to, as taxpayers to think about yourselves as integral in American education reform. I want you to develop an appetite for these school experiences because you will be the, our allies, the allies for schools when we're told to be test prep mechanisms and you have developed an appetite and a hunger for the social impact that schools can have. We need you, our students need you, so thanks for being here tonight.